So drawing diags is fun, um, and it's a really useful exercise to go through to map your philosophical model onto um, kind of a graphical form. Um, it's really useful, especially if you're writing um, specific research about different phenomena. Um, people can challenge your DAG. Um, and they can say you're missing some nodes or this thing's not connected to the right place. Um, and it kind of gives a, a common way of critiquing your work and critiquing your theory instead of just saying, I don't buy this relationship. They can say specifically why they don't buy it and what's missing. And so it's really good for giving a, a, a common language to discussing causal relationships. Um, but where these DAGs get even more important and more powerful is um, their ability to tell us how to isolate specific pathways. And this is why they're so great. Um, drawing a diag is neat, and we can have like a fully encoded um, causal diagram here. We know that we can pretend that this is the full causal diagram for education causing earnings. These are the only things that also cause education um, and earnings. You have job connections, you have year, location of birth, background, all of this stuff. If we assume that this is the complete explanation for this relationship, then we can call it good. Um, again, people can fight us on this. They can say, you're missing a node. This needs to be connected there. And so there's a systematic way of talking about what's missing, um, which is nice. Um, so what we want to do now that we have kind of a complete causal graph is um, we care most about the relationship between education and earnings here. The most important arrow is this right here. Um, by drawing arrows between everything else, we are saying that there is some correlation between something unknown and location, or between the year of birth and your education, or year of birth and earnings. Um, just by drawing an arrow, we're saying that there's some causal effect or some associative effect um, between these nodes. What we care about the most, though, is that single arrow there. So what do we do about the other nodes and arrows? How do we, like, how do we take care of those so they're not influencing that single relationship there that we care about? And that's what brings us to this idea of causal identification, which is the goal for this class, is to be able to identify specific causal effects. Um, the idea of identification has lots of different definitions, especially if you've taken an economics class before. Um, most economics paper have, papers have a specific section called the identification strategy, which is how you identify the link between a cause and effect. Um, in DAG language, I find it is a lot more intuitive um, because it's essentially this idea here. A causal effect is identified if that arrow between cause between the treatment and the outcome or the program and the outcome is isolated. Um, and so that is our goal is to get that one arrow between X and Y or between earnings and or between education and earnings. We want that to be isolated and not influenced by other things in the DAG. And once that happens, then we have an isolated causal effect. Um, so in a causal diagram, all of those arrows are important. They transmit associations or transmit um, correlations or causal effects. And what makes these DAGs super powerful is that you can rearrange um, or redirect the associations between different variables and between different nodes in the graph. And you do this by adjusting for nodes or conditioning on specific nodes. It's the same language um, for both. It, it just means taking into account specific nodes. Um, and if you can do all, if you can deal with all of the correct nodes, then what you're left with at the end is a properly identified and properly stripped down causal effect between the two nodes that you care about the most. Um, and so that is where we get into the magic of DAGs here. Um, to talk about this, we're going to talk about three specific types of associations that you see in DAGs. And this has to do with the arrows that you see between these nodes here. So if you look at this first one here, this is confounding. Um, or another way of talking about it is common cause, where you have X causes Y, that's the thing we care about the most, but Z also causes X and causes Y at the same time. And so Z is confounding that relationship between X and Y. Um, and so if we just measure the effect of X and Y and call that good, that's not going to be a causal effect because Z is messing up that relationship. So if we can do something to 
control for z or adjust for z or condition on z, that's all phrases that mean the same thing here, um, then we can remove the effect of z from x and y and we're left with an isolated causal effect. Um, another type of association here is when the arrows are in this type of arrangement um, where you have a causal relationship. And so here we have x causing y, that's the thing we care about. X also causes Z, which then causes Y. In this situation, Z is a mediator. Um, it's mediating the effect between X and Y. We could also say that X causes Y directly. That's how we've drawn it in this graph here. But X causes Z, which then causes Y. Um, in situations like this, we'll talk about it in a minute, you probably don't actually want to include Z as a control variable um, because that's going to eat up some of the effect between cause or the effect of x on y. Um, if we're interested in the total effect of x on y, you don't necessarily want to deal with the mediators. The final version of, of a DAG relationship here is when the arrows both point away from specific nodes here. So here we're going to say x causes y. That's the thing we want to care about. Um, that's the thing we want to measure. But the way we've drawn this here is that we have x causes z. So, some, so our program causes something to happen, but our outcome also causes that thing to happen. In this situation, you do not want to control for z. Um, what this does is it causes something called a selection effect, or in economics land, we call this endogeneity, um, where this will actually distort the causal effect between x and y if we include z and if we deal with z. So we don't want to do that. Um, and so this is important because um, if we can learn to identify these different types of relationships, if we can figure out which of our variables are confounders, which of our variables are mediators, and which of our variables are colliders, um, then we'll know what things we should control for and how we should adjust the different variables we have to isolate that x to y relationship. So we'll talk about each of these in turn now in more depth so you can see what these look like um, and what it actually means to confound and mediate and collide. So first we'll start with confounding here. So with confounding, this is the idea that x causes y, but you have something else called z that causes both x and y. And so because z is causing both of those things, z confounds that relationship. Another way of talking about this confounding is this idea of doors and pathways. Um, so if we write out all of the different paths that can connect x and y, where x and y lie on the same path, there's one path that goes from x to y, and we can write that out, say x leads to y. Um, there's another path where if we start at z, we could get to y, and then that's going to connect um, to x, it's going to connect x and y there. Um, and so we have this, um, if we write out the pathway here, we have z causes x, but z also causes y. And if you notice the direction of the arrow here, there's an arrow pointing back into x. The fact that you have an arrow pointing back into x means that z is a back door into x. Um, there's a backdoor path into the main treatment that we have or the main program that we have, um, which then distorts the effect that we have between x and y. There's a backdoor, um, this association or the causal effect of z is kind of getting um, inserted into the main causal effect, the causal relationship we care about between x and y. And so that is distorting that effect because of this backdoor that we have. Um, Another way of talking about it with uh, causal diagram language is this idea of deconnection. D in this case stands for direction. That's just um, what they what it means here. Um, so x and y in this situation are deconnected because associations there can be an association between x and y because of z. So even if we didn't have an arrow, if you imagined that we just had a graph with no arrow here where we're saying x and y are not connected at all, there's no relationship between them, the fact that we have z causing x and z causing y actually links them and opens up an association between them, and they are deconnected. 
and once that happens, um, that distorts this one arrow here that we care about. The main thing we care about again is um, the relationship between X and Y. This arrow right here is our goal. That is our program effect. And if there's anything else that is deconnected to X or to Y, then that's going to distort our relationship and it's not going to be isolated or identified. And so we can't talk about causal effects anymore because Z is confounding that. Um, so let's look at a practical example of that. Um, here is a DAG here that shows the effect of campaign fundraising or money on elections um, or on the win margin of an election. And so the main question we have here are, is, does raising more money cause you to win by a greater margin in an electoral race? Um, and so we have this simple DAG here saying that campaign money causes win margin, which is the thing we're trying to measure. But the the quality of the candidate also causes campaign money to be different. If you have a high quality candidate, they're probably going to be able to raise more money. At the same time, having a high quality candidate is going to cause a greater win margin. And so candidate quality is messing up the relationship between campaign money and win margin. It is confounding that relationship. Um, or it is a back door. We can actually write this out if we um, list all of the different paths between money and win margin. We have two different paths. We have a direct path between money and win margin, but we can also say if we start at quality, that gets us to campaign money, but it also connects us to win margin. So we have this pathway here, money, quality, margin, but if you notice this arrow is pointing backwards, which means quality is a backdoor to the relationship between money and margin. So in order to get rid of that effect, or the effect of candidate quality, we need to close that back door. Um, and so if we can adjust for Z, um, that is enough to remove the association between, X, between Z and X and Z and Y. And then all we're left with is the isolated or identified arrow here between X and Y. That's the thing we care about. So in the, the campaign quality example here, here's our DAG. We have campaign money causing win margin, but there's this confounding um, that's coming from candidate quality to both of those. Um, it is a backdoor to that effect that we care about. So if we want to close that backdoor, this is what we do statistically. We figure out what part of campaign money is explained by candidate quality. So we figure out maybe half of the money that people raise is because of candidate quality. And so we remove that. And so what we're left with X here is the money that people raise outside of candidate quality. Um, and so what we're left with after we've adjusted for candidate quality or removed the quality part from campaign money is kind of campaign money minus the quality part. We do the same thing for margin. We figure out what portion of win margin is explained by candidate quality and then take that out. And what we're left with is win margin minus the quality parts of it. And so then if we find the causal effect of X on Y here or money on margin, what we're really finding is the quality less version of money and the quality less version of margin. That is the causal effect of money on win margin. Um, so that is our whole goal here. If we close that back door by removing the quality parts of our different nodes, um, then what that lets us do is compare candidates as if they had the same quality. And it removes any differences in outcomes that are because of quality. Um, another way of talking about this is saying we're holding quality constant. And if you remember from the regression session that we talked about um, in session two, that's what we're doing when we have control variables. We're holding things constant. So if we control for something in a regression model, conceptually, that is the same as adjusting for it. Um, we are removing, if we control with the penguins, for example, we controlled for species. So what that meant is that we took out the portion of penguin weight that was explained by species. Um, and then we took out the portion of penguin weight that was explained by build depth or by flipper length or other things. Um, and so what that let us do was kind of compare penguins um, 
at the same type, like as the same type of species or any differences that existed between different penguins, we were able to eliminate the differences that came from these other confounding um, explanations. So that is conceptually what we're doing when we make adjustments. Um, so for instance, if we had a regression model where we're going to predict win margin based on campaign money, if we have a column in a data set for how much money people raise, and then if we had some sort of measure of candidate quality, um, we could say like on a scale of zero to 100, how good of a candidate a person is. Um, if we control for candidate quality, that is essentially um, closing the back door. And then the coefficient here, this beta one, theoretically should be the causal effect of campaign money on win margin. Assuming the DAG is correct and we don't have any other confounders or any other back doors, if we pretend that this is a complete perfect DAG, um, once we control for the back door, this coefficient here, we can start talking about using causal language. Um, in a couple weeks, we will talk about how this doesn't actually perfectly work, um, just controlling for something in a regression model. Um, that's why we have other um, approaches. We can use matching, we can use stratification, um, we can use inverse probability weighting, which is kind of the best way of doing this. And we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. Um, but if you can just conceptually think of this idea of um, when you're making adjustments or when you're closing back doors, it's basically like including terms as control variables in a regression model. That's not what you're going to be doing in, all, like, in real life, but that's conceptually what you're doing. You're taking away, like once you control for quality here, you're taking the quality parts out of money and win margin. There are different ways of doing that with matching inverse probability weighting, more accurate ways, but that's essentially what you're doing at the core of, of all of this causal model stuff is you're, you're closing these back doors by controlling for these things or adjusting for these things. So if we come back to here, once you control for Z, X and Y are now de-separated instead of de-connected. And so this association here, this X to Y relationship is now isolated and identified. Um, and so once we do that, we can start talking about causation. In this situation with money and quality and win margin, we only had one backdoor. But if you have a more complicated DAG, you're going to have more potential backdoors here. And your goal with these DAGs is to identify all of the backdoors so that you know what you need to control for or what you need to adjust for to isolate the relationship. So to do that, what you have to do is essentially list out all of the pathways between education and earnings um, including other nodes that lead to education and earnings. So in this DAG right here, this is a list of all of the different pathways that exist between education and earnings. So notice here I've written education, earnings. Each of these lines starts with education, ends with earnings. Um, and then in between, I have all of the nodes that let you get between these things. So job, so education leads to earnings, that's one pathway. Education leads to job connection, leads to earnings. That's here, education, job connections, earnings. We also have background leads to education and background leads to earnings. That's this node right here. Background leads to education, background leads to earnings. Um, notice here we have our unobserved. That's in one of our pathways that an unobserved thing leads to your background, which then leads to education. Unobserved stuff also leads to location, which then leads to earnings. So it can kind of get more complex here with the different pathways you have. So what you do with these DAGs is you just list out every potential pathway between your treatment or your program and your outcome or your effect. Um, then once you've done that, the way you identify what is a backdoor is you look at the direction of the arrows pointing into education. If there is an arrow going backwards into your treatment or into your program or into education here, that is then a backdoor. So background is a backdoor. Here it is again, it's a backdoor. Location is a backdoor. And year is a backdoor. So according to this, we have three backdoors. We have year, location, and background. So if we control, for those things, you notice here they're squares. That means we're controlling for it. 
or adjusting for it. As long as we can adjust for location, background, and year, then we've isolated the relationship between education and earnings. The really cool thing about this is notice that we have not included required schooling. We didn't include that in our regression model. We didn't control for job connections. Um, the other cool thing here is we have unobserved stuff that we can't actually measure. But the associations that come from that un unobserved stuff get blocked by these controlled um, nodes here. Once we adjust for location and background, all of that unobserved stuff can't come down into the education and earnings relationship and it won't mess it up. So even though we can't measure this stuff, if we measure location and background, that's good enough to block all of the associations that come. And so we're left with just this isolated education to earnings um, relationship, which is really cool. So uh, theoretically, um, again, regression models, just including these as control variables, doesn't work 100% of the time, but conceptually, that's kind of what you're going to be doing, is if you had a column with education, a column with earnings, and columns for year, location, background, if you ran a regression model that said education or earnings is explained by education plus year plus location plus background, the coefficient for education would be your causal effect. Um, assuming this DAG is correct um, and assuming that everything is linear, which is never the case, which is why we don't use regression for this. Um, we'll use other methods for adjusting. But if you think conceptually, that is essentially what you're doing is controlling for these things in a regression model. Um, that is how you isolate that, if, that, that relationship between education and earnings. That's identified all as well. You have to close the back doors to get that isolated, but then you're good. Um, writing out all those paths is really tedious and hard. You can let the computer do this. Um, so I mentioned uh, before that you can draw things with Daggety, um, this website. And um, the reason why you want to draw your DAGs with Daggety instead of with um, some of those uh, flowchart programs that you use for your logic models is that Daggety was designed for um, identifying different pathways. And so it will actually tell you all of the different pathways between your program and your outcome. And it will tell you what things you need to control for to close back doors. Um, it will do all of that listing for you. It'll have a list of the different variables that you need to adjust for, and it does it all automatically. Um, you can also do this with R. There's a package called ggdag that lets you draw the DAGs, but then there's a package called Daggity that applies that same backdoor logic and it'll tell you what nodes you need to control for and it'll have a list of the things that you need to adjust for. And so it is, it's very, very useful. Um, again, in the guide for today, um, in the resources section, I have an example of how to do this, um, both with Daggety and with R, so you can see how to identify all of the different pathways that you need to adjust for. Um, importantly, you need to be able to test to see if your DAG is right. And this is hard. Um, we've, we've been saying, like, if we assume this DAG is perfect and it includes everything, then the relationship between education and earnings will be correct. Um, but that's a big assumption. And it's really, really hard to test. Um, the nice thing about DAGity and about these DAGs in general is that once you um, draw these arrows, the logic of these DAGs means that you have a whole bunch of testable implications. Every time you draw an arrow, you're saying there is a relationship between location and education. So if you had a column in your data set called location and a column in your data set called education, there should be some correlation between them. If you ran the correlation function in R, it would not be zero, it would be something. And so that's what you're saying is that I think that there is a relationship there. The other cool thing about these DAGs is it will tell you where there is no relationship because of the logic of how the arrows are drawn. So if you look here, this list of testable implications here is essentially a list of things that should be true about the correlation between these different variables. And the special mathematical symbol here, this upside down T, um, the way you read this is you say X is independent of Y. So if you look at this last one here, this says that education is, or year is independent of location. What that means is year and location, given the arrows that we have, 
years down here, locations here, they're not connected at all, they should have no correlation. If we ran the correlation function in R on these two columns, location and year, there should be zero correlation between them. And that is actually testable with the data. And if that is true, neat. Um, we can also say a year should be independent of background. Um, because of how the arrows are drawn here, there's no relationship between the two. So if we um, test the correlation with R, in theory, there should be no correlation between them. The other mathematical symbol that you see in this list of implications is this up and down um, line here. That we read as given or conditional on. So what this means, if we look at kind of a simple one here, um, this says job connections should be independent of year given education. So that means for people that have similar levels of education, there should be no connection between job connections and year. Um, and the only reason that works is because of these arrows here. And so we can test that. If, you've, if you um, did a correlation, you grouped by different levels of education, you said, here's everybody with um, high school education only, just look at them and then see if there's a correlation between job connections and year. Hopefully that's zero. This is what the, the DAG is saying, it should be zero. Then you look at college graduates, only them, and see if there's a relationship between job connections and year. Hopefully there's not. Then you look at graduate students. If they're just look at them and see if there's a correlation between job connections and year. So that's what that, that up and down line means. It's given. So you're looking at specific subsections of your data. There should be no relationship between different variables. These can get even more complicated. If you look here, this says that education and earnings should not be related given somebody's background, job connections, location, and year. So for somebody that has the same background, job connections, location, and year, there should be no connection between education and earnings. Um, that is technically the thing we're trying to measure there. Um, and so we want there to be something in that case. Um, but with these others, required schooling should be completely independent of job connections for people with the same level of education. Um, required schooling should be completely separate from earnings, not connected at all for people with the same level of background, education, location, and year. Um, so that, that's how you read these things. Is you say, this should be independent of this, given these different other variables. And the cool thing about this is this is fully testable with your data. If you have columns here, you can test these things. You can run correlations um, and see if year and location really are not connected. If they are, then that means you probably have the DAG wrong, that there's some arrow that's connecting location and year somehow. And so then you have to revisit your philosophical model to see what could potentially be linking year and location. If they're not connected, cool, you got that arrow right. Um, and so this is one way of, of testing your DAG. Um, so that is kind of the backdoor world here. That is our... Um, the confounding relationship. There are two other relationships relationships that we talked about though. We have causal relationships, which is this here, where we say that X causes Y, X causes Z, and then Z also causes Y. So the main question with these relationships is, should you control for Z? Or should you adjust for Z? Should you include Z in your model? Um, in the in our example of um, this DAG right here, a Z relationship would be job connections, where education causes job connections and then job connections cause earnings. So should we adjust for job connections? And according to DAG logic, we should not. This leads to something called over-controlling. Um, because if our main question is, what is the relationship between X and Y, or education and earnings, if we include Z, that eats up some of the relationship between X and Y. That eats up some of the total effect. So if we look back at this example here, education causes earnings, but if we control for job connections, if we adjust for that, then what happens is we essentially take out the part of education that, or the part of education that causes earnings through job connections. So we're removing that part, and so it's not the total effect anymore. Um, and so it creates what is essentially uh, it 
has different terms. One is bad controls, where it's going to reduce that relationship that we care about. Another um, definition is over controlling. We have too many controls in there. And so we don't need to control for, for job connections there because that's going to reduce that arrow. We don't need job connections to isolate the education to earnings relationship because it's not being confounded. That's just going to kind of mess up or distort or reduce that relationship. So don't. Um, we don't need to worry about that mediator there. The final relationship that we care about is the trickiest one. These are called colliders. So the idea here is that X causes Y, so education causes earnings, but X causes Z, something else, and Y causes Z, or something else. Should you include Z in your um, adjustment? Should you adjust for Z? Should you control for Z? And the answer here is no. It can mess up your um, findings completely, and you don't want to do that. This creates what is called a collider. You have the effect of X and the effect of Y colliding in Z here. So an example of this, a different example, is this question here. Do programming skills reduce social skills? So are good programmers um, less socially apt? Um, and so we can have this question here. We say programming skills causes social skills. So let's say you go to a fancy tech company. You go to Google or Facebook or Apple, and you run a survey there um, to see if there's a relationship, um, which sounds logical because you're looking at people with tech skills. And you find that there's a negative relationship. You say programming skills reduces social skills. Um, and you say, oh, no, this is bad. People should not learn programming because it's going to cause you to have bad social skills. The problem with doing that, though, is that this relationship is not actually real. Because being hired by a tech company, if you're only looking at people in a tech company, that is a collider. Programming skills makes it so that you get hired by a tech company. Social skills makes it so you're hired by a tech company. Um, they'll only hire people who have good, good social skills, who fit well with, with uh, the company culture, who work well with teams. And so once you do that, if you're only looking at Z, um, so if your sample only includes Z, that's essentially adjusting for Z. And so you're only looking at that. What that does is it, it inadvertently connects X and Y. So even though there might not be a relationship between them at all, if you're looking at only people in a tech company, then suddenly you're linking the two. And then whatever relationship you have between X and Y is going to be wrong. It could be wildly positive. It could be wildly negative. It could be zero when there is an effect. It, it messes stuff up. Um, so colliders can either create causal effects. They can hide real causal effects. They can do all sorts of weird things. Um, another example of this is um, this chart right here. It shows that there's no relationship between basketball skill and um, height. So the taller you are, that has no effect on points per game. Um, the issue, though, is this is only true for NBA players. Um, this is the Chicago Bulls from 2009 to 2010. Among basketball players who are professional and super good, there is no relationship between height and the number of points you score in a game. Um, among regular people, there is a huge effect. Um, my, I have an eight-year-old who is very short, and he sucks at basketball. He does not score very many points. There is clearly a causal relationship between height and points. But if you're in the NBA, that relationship disappears. We can draw a dag for this. We can say we assume that there is a relationship between X and Y. Height causes points to be scored. But height also causes you to be in the NBA. People in the NBA are typically taller because basketball, the baskets are high. You want tall players. Um, the number of points you score causes you to be in the NBA. The better you are at playing basketball, the higher skills you have, the more likely it is you're going to be in the NBA. And so if you're only looking at NBA players, that's going to distort the height and points relationship. Um, another way of thinking about this is selection bias. Um, if you're only looking at NBA players, that is the same as conditioning on a collider. Um, this is the case for any type of selection bias. And so if you have a program, for instance, for a nonprofit organization, and you conduct a survey um, among all of your um, all of the clients that you work with, 
um, that's cool, but it's only picking up the people who you work with and it's not going to pick up everybody. And so that is essentially controlling for um, a collider. It's your, or your type of clients that you're working with. Um, if you're working with um, truant or um, absent students and you're only looking at them, um, then that's going to be controlling for that node in the DAG. And that might distort any effects that you have, especially if your outcome also causes truancy or has a causal relationship or an association with truancy. And so you want to avoid colliders. If you include a collider in your model, if you adjust for the collider, it's going to distort your causal effect. Um, and so you don't want to do that. So we can review these things here. These are the three main types of associations that you want to care about when you're looking at DAGs. You have confounders, you have mediators, and you have colliders. Um, in general, you want to adjust for confounders um, because you want to remove the common cause that they have. You want to remove the association that you have from Z to X and Z to Y so you can isolate that relationship. With mediators, you typically don't want to adjust for those because that's going to remove some of this relationship between X and Y, which is what you care about the most. With colliders, you don't want to adjust for these things um, because that's going to distort the relationship between X and Y. It might add a causal effect where there is none. It might remove a causal effect where there is one. Um, it might just give you the wrong numbers because um, you're looking at a specific type of population. Um, so you want to avoid colliders um, so that you can get the right um, isolated relationship. So this is kind of the, the basic logic of DAGs here, is being able to identify these different associations um, based on the arrows and how the arrows are pointed, um, and then be able to apply specific rules to be able to isolate the one pathway that you care about. So close the back doors of confounders, don't deal with mediators, definitely don't deal with colliders, and you should be able to isolate X and Y using observational data. Um, in the next session next week, we'll talk more specifically about how to do this um, using specific rules of do calculus. Um, we'll also talk more specifically about how to do this practically um, with R um, and with regression models and other things. And for the rest of the semester, that's what we're going to be talking about. When we talk about regression discontinuity or instrumental variables or difference and differences, all of those are based on DAGs and the relationships between different nodes, and they're all approaches for isolating this X to Y relationship, um, for closing different back doors and kind of making sure that that relationship is identified. Um, so in your assignment for next week, you'll have lots of practice closing back doors and playing with Daggity um, or playing with GG Dag if you're using R um, to close these back doors. And so have fun practicing with that. And this is kind of the core of the class here for the rest of the semester. So good luck.